So Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be favorable toward these people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. Well, brethren, if they were there before God to plead for Israel, Moses and Samuel, it would not help. Moses was the one who said to God, if you're going to wipe them out, wipe my name out of your book. Obviously, that's the reference to the book of life. And Samuel was the one who said, wait a minute, God, you know, don't throw away Saul. And Samuel grieved and moaned and beseeched God. So God says, even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, if they would be beseeching me for these people, they could not change my mind about these people. Well, cast them out of my sight. They cannot learn it any other way. I tried other ways, but they have now come to the place that that is the only way they can learn. And the next verse, verse 2, sets the scene. Sword and famine continue. The people in Judah will die one way or another. Verse 2, And it shall be, if they say to you, Where should we go? Then you shall tell them, Thus says the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. Well, brethren, it has already been decreed that they will die, some by the sword, others by the famine, and some for captivity. God again, as we see, reveals himself by these four things coming on the house of Judah. Death, sword, famine, and captivity. Verse 3. And I'll appoint over them four forms of destruction. Here are four again. Four forms of destruction, says the Lord. The sword to slay, the dogs to drag, the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. So again, they're speaking symbolically of human governments and nations being like birds and beasts, you know. And then it continues in verse 4, And I will hand them over to trouble to all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. Now about Manasseh, you can read in the book of uh, in the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, you can read about the worst, I would say, of all the kings that occupied the throne of David. Manasseh, I mentioned him just a couple of hours ago as I was discussing things in Serbian language with the believers. Uh, Manasseh was the worst kind of a king you can imagine. The man, it's the man who sacrificed his firstborn children to the demons. The man who allowed all kinds of paganism and perversity in the house of Judah. And interestingly enough, he even repented, you know. He repented and was restored to the throne later, and then he died, and then his successor came after him. So that's very quite, quite that's quite interesting, you know, brethren, because uh, however deprived this man was, in, at the end, he did repent and he did turn to the eternal, and was restored even to the to the to the kingship. He was restored to the position of being a king, which means. The same message is to all of you and to me and to everybody else. However bad sin as we were, we can still be forgiven. God says through Isaiah that if our if our sins will be like uh, scarlet, red as scarlet, they will become white as snow. Yes, that's what the blood of Jesus Christ can do in our lives. So if we repent and turn to God, brethren, then all our slate is wiped clean and we become completely clean as if, we, as if we have never sinned in our life. And that's what the baptism does. At baptism, a one person becomes totally clean by the blood of Jesus Christ through the immersion, symbolically bearing the old person, the old sinful self, and then symbolically coming out of the water into the newness of life. And then, and then when the slate is wiped, wiped clean, only at that point, when there is no sin in us, God can send His Holy Spirit from heaven to join our 
spirit of man, and then we become spirit begotten children of God, and we spiritually grow until the time comes that we are to become born children of God. And as it's Romans, I often told you it's Romans 1. No, it's Romans 8, actually. It's Romans 8, verses 21, 22, 23. Romans 8 actually see, see, uh, says that the whole creation, meaning the whole universe, including our earth, the whole creation is eagerly waiting for the appearance of the sons of God and daughters of God so that the whole creation will be will depart finally from decay and death. You see, brethren, that's what it is. That's what was the ultimate purpose of humankind. That many members be added into God's family. And then they have this, 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 this endless universe with countless stars and, and, and heavenly bodies that we can beautify and make alive and breathe in life into them. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that brilliant? But again, I often would say it was in Romans 1. No, in Romans, I would, I would confuse two things. In Roman, Romans 1, it says that we are to worship creator, not the creation. While in Romans 8, actually, it says that uh, the whole universe, the whole creation of God, is eagerly waiting for the appearance or the birth, if you wish, of the sons of God and daughters of God. So the whole creation is waiting for the first resurrection so eagerly, indeed, because then we will start first to restore this earth, to prepare it for the second resurrection, and then once those in the second resurrection are given chance, their only chance for salvation, in those 100 years, after that comes the, uh, comes the second part. It's not described in detail in, in the Bible, but we can uh, deduce from what we read there that the whole universe, cosmos, is waiting for us to breathe in life into it. Because right now cosmos is lifeless. In vain are all the efforts by NASA and any other institution to find life in cosmos. No, they won't find it. There is no life in cosmos. That's why the whole creation being now in decay and being subjected to death is waiting eagerly for us to appear as the sons and daughters of God, to be born again at Christ's return, so that then we can breathe in life into the whole universe. Anyway, continuing with uh, chapter 15, speaking of the depravity of Jerusalem and the house of Judah, verse 4, God says, I'll hand them over to trouble, to all kingdoms of the earth, because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, the son of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. So captivity is going to be a major thing, brethren. Dispersion of Jews in the past was just a type of what is coming. This time and this way, it will be of their own choice, you see. Because in the days of Jeremiah, they were just carried to Babylon. They were not destroyed by the sword. Now Manasseh was the most wicked king of all and God uses him as a type for that which he did in Jerusalem. What King Manasseh did was so horrible, brethren, he'll make the remembrance of it. And when you read about the, the, the account in the Kings and, and the Chronicles about those who occupied the throne of David, you can make a horrible horror movie out of that. So scary. But people don't understand that the, that the covenant that God made with David was unconditional. God did not put condition that there will be always human on his throne if that human was a noble, nice, God-fearing, wonderful individual. Not at all, brethren. It was unconditional covenant that said that there will be always a human descendant, at least until the end of this age, after which Jesus Christ, who is also descendant of David, will occupy the throne forever. So the condition was, the only condition was that there will always be a human being or a descendant of David on that throne until Christ returns and then beyond for all eternity, you know. There is no other conditions at all. And that's why people say, well, how can you supposedly glorify British, British royal family or this, that and the other? Can't you, can't you see how bad they are? Yes, I can see how bad they are, but it's history repeating itself. Their ancestors were no better. And the condition was that there will be always a human descendant. The condition was not any other. 
And God even confirmed his covenant with David, saying, If the sun will not rise tomorrow morning, if the moon will not appear on, up, up on the sky tonight, then only then and only then I will transgress my covenant with David. In other words, only then, only in such a case, there will be no descendant on David's throne. But as we know, the sun has risen this morning. The moon is going to appear tonight, brethren. And uh, yes, indeed, the covenant is sure. The covenant remains. But again, it doesn't mean that those who occupy the throne of David are all saints and, 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 and wonderful God-fearing people. Not at all, brethren. King Manasseh was so horrible. What he did was so horrible, he'll make the remembrance of it. The value of Hinnom will be a continual reminder. Or the value of Tophet. That king led the house of Israel into idolatry which involved the sacrifice of children. He himself sacrificed his own children to Baal. And we can ask the question today, could a portion be related to that in part? Sacrifice is a result of sin as a major case. Verse 5, For who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Or who will bemoan you? Or who will turn aside to ask how you are doing? You have forsaken me, says the Lord. You have gone backward. Therefore I will stretch out my hand against you and destroy you. I am weary of relenting. You see, there are always those prayers for the people and God will always relent to unleash his full power and his full furor and anger at the uh, backsliding house of Israel and later backsliding house of Judah. Verse 7, And I will winnow them with a winnowing fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. And so, I will destroy my people, since they do not return from their ways. You see, brethren, they want all the blessings, but they want to be going their ways. <laughs> Just like humans today, aren't they? They want all the blessings, but, you know, they would rather go their own way. Why should God meddle into their lives? And why should God, why should anybody, including God, tell them how to run their lives? Well, God has the right to tell you how to run your life because He's the ultimate authority. Then verse 8. Their window, their widows will be increased to me more than the sand of the seas. I'll bring against them, against the mother of the young men, a plunderer at noonday. I'll cause anguish and terror to fall on them suddenly. So, you know, brethren, so many died in war, and so many died in other ways, that widows have just increased unbelievably in numbers. We have read earlier how the destroyer is coming at noon. So now we see in the first part of this chapter that all those who laid their lives and stood for the nation or a king, I'll not go through all that again because those they stood for, kings and the nation of Israel, refused to repent. They refused to return and so he uses Moses and Samuel. And that happens more than once as we will see later. Verse 9. She languishes who has borne seven. She has breathed her last. Her son was gone down while it was yet day. She has been born ashamed and confounded. And the remnant of them I'll deliver to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. Well, seven being the perfect number indicates full fruitfulness. Yet seven, but not even these will suffice. Jerusalem is also the parent of many cities, villages, and families in the land. Now, seven is put for many. One example is First Samuel chapter 2, verse 5. So, seven is put for many. And the multitude of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the mother city, is here alluded to. The prophet pursuing the metaphor of the coming verse and describing the mother city under the figure of a woman that has been that had been faithful, but was now become, become feeble and bore no children. He means that the people of Judah, which had been very numerous, were now greatly diminished. It says here, sun is gone down while it was yet a day. 
Well, in the midst of her prosperity, brethren, she's reduced to this state of misery, being of a sudden, being all of a sudden overwhelmed with the greatest calamities, when she may have expected a long continuance in her, of happiness. And this expression, the expression is extremely strong, and uh, it denotes a sudden change from the highest dignity to the lowest abasement. Interesting, you know, from the highest nobility to the lowest, to the lowest uh, uh, abasement. So mothers are put to shame, you know, of disappointed hopes through the loss of all their children. Verse 10, Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and a man of con contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent to me for interest. Every one of them curses me. Well, the prophet here complains of the opposition he met with from his uh, countrymen for speaking unwelcome truths. Jeremiah seems to have been of a peculiar, peculiarly sensitive temperament, but yet the Holy Spirit enabled him to deliver his message at a, decree, a certain cost of having his sensitivities wounded by the enemies of those whom his words offended. Verse 11, the Lord said, Surely it will be well with your remnant. Surely I'll cause the enemy to intercede with you in the name of adversity and in the name of affliction. Now this was literally fulfilled if you see Jeremiah 39 verse 11 and other scripture. Nebuchadnezzar had given strict cha charge to Nebuzaradan, commander-in-chief, to look well to Jeremiah, to do him no harm and to grant him all the privileges he was pleased to ask. However, the remnant here is referring to the remnant of Israel, what remained from captivity. It was Jeremiah, the king Zedekiah's daughters, and the scribe Baruch. It will be well with the remnant of Jeremiah. It will be well with his company. Verse 12. Can anyone break iron, the northern iron and the bronze? In other words, can our weak forces be able to oppose and overcome the powers of the Chaldeans? Your wealth and your treasures I'll give as plunder without price because of all your sins throughout your territories. So here God turns his speech from the people to the people. Actually from the prophet himself to the people. Thy substance and thy treasures will I give to the, the spoil. You see, all thy riches and precious things shall be spoiled. There shall be no price taken for the redemption of them. Then for all thy sins in all thy borders. You see, all parts of the country and even which lay most remote had contributed to the national guilt and all shall be brought to account. And I'll make thee to pass with thine, thine enemies, etc. Well, they shall... In their own country, they shall stay there till they see their estates and all their property ruined. And then they will be carried into captivity to spend the remains of a miserable life in slavery. Now all of this is the fruit of God's wrath. For a fire, says he, is kindled in mine anger which shall burn upon you. And if not extinguished in time, it will burn to eternity, as we know. Verse 14, And I'll make your cross over with your enemies into a land which you do not know, for a fire is kindled in my anger, which shall burn upon you. You see, God does have emotions, brethren. His anger is taken out righteously. Now God is 
God is not harsh. The sins of the people, let him to be, actually to do these things, to be among them and to do these things. We are in verse 15. O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your enduring patience, do not take me away. Know that for your sake I have suffered rebuke. Your words were found and I ate them and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. O Lord God of hosts. So, all is well. And, uh, you know, it was, the the prophet was called by, by God's name. There was all of a sudden, no, there was uh, enduring patience and uh, persecutors, some of them have, have relented somewhat. And I did, it says in verse 17, I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone because of your hand, for you have filled me with indignation. Now, verse 18 continues. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will you surely be to me like an unreliable stream, as waters that fail? You see, this is the prayer of a man in bitter grief, brethren, whose human nature cannot at present submit to the the divine will. And God's long-standing suffering toward the wicked seemed to be seemed to the prophet to be the abandonment of himself to death. Verse 19, Therefore thus says the Lord, If you return, then I'll bring you back. Then shall stand before me, you shall stand before me. If you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as to my mouth, let them return to you. But you must not return to them. Now, this is what God told Jeremiah specifically. But brethren, it is applicable to all of us today. Because be careful not to give into their ways. You'll be delivered. Jeremiah needed to have reassurance and encouragement. You know, restore the to their own country. Jeremiah had greatly repined because of the persecution which he endured. The Lord basically reprehended him and is about to take him from the, to take him from the, uh, to take from him the prophetic gift that is. He is, but you know, exhorts him first to take the precious from the vial, not to attend to the deceitful words of the people, but boldly declare the message he had given him, not to return unto the people, but let the people return unto him. Not to return unto the people, but let the people return unto him, and then he should be as God's mouth. His words should appear to be what they were, the genuine words of God, and the people should be obliged to acknowledge them as such. We are in verse 20 and 21. And I'll make you to this people a fortified bronze wall. And they'll fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I'll deliver you from the hand of the wicked, and I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. So the promise of Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 18 and 19 in almost the same words is right here, but with the addition adapted to the present attacks of Jeremiah's formidable enemies. It says, I'll deliver thee out of wicked, redeem you out of terrible. The repetition is in order to assure Jeremiah that God is the same now as when he first made the promise. So basically that's how chapter 15 is 
concluded. So Jeremiah is there. He is discouraged by all kinds of persecutions and misunderstandings. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the Eternal is there to help him, to give him his help and aid, and Jeremiah is to continue to be fulfilling his mission that he was given by the Eternal.